using data to develop algorithms, but also actually drive efficiency and effectiveness on the farm level. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the next frontier, and that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And we have that slogan, and you saw that today as well, making the invisible visible. Yeah. Um, really getting a, a picture on what's happening on the farm level and yeah. then making a difference between farmer A and farmer B, where farmer A gets rewarded and recognized for the efforts he or she is making versus farmer B. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of system we need to set up. Making it possible together is the slogan of DSM Vermenich Animal Nutrition and Health. But what does that mean? That's the subject we are going to discuss in this episode of Future Feed Talks. My name is Iris Hoffman and I'm editor at Miset International Media and this series is in cooperation with DSM Vermenich. We are discussing the strategies that DSM Vermenich has to connect different parts of the agricultural sector with Ivo Landsbergen. He is the president of Animal Nutrition and Health at DSM Vermenich and is able to explain more about the steps DSM Vermenich takes to contribute to a brighter future in animal nutrition. Hello Ivo, um, thank you for being here at Future Feed Talks. Mm. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you with uh, well, the official merge of DSM and Vermenich. Yeah. Uh, what is this going to mean for the company and also the making it possible together? Right. For the company uh, as such, um, it's the, I would say, the, the finalization of a huge transformation that we've been going through for the last two, nearly even three decades. Um, and why do you say the two or three decades? Because we acquired Gisbergades. Gisbergades actually was a, a Dutch company. That was our first kind of step into life sciences. And then um, somewhere around 2002, 2003, we acquired Roche. Uh, that was with the vitamins. We became more life sciences oriented. We still had material sciences. And material sciences were, uh, that's where I grew up actually, um, were divested this year. Uh, so engineering materials was divested, resins was divested earlier, Dyneema was uh, divested. So now we are becoming a true kind of focus company on life sciences, which is really a kind of a more united uh, focus company rather than a, a diversified company. So that's, um, I would say, pretty major in the history of of the company, uh, where you know uh, that DSM stands for Dutch State Mines, mm -hmm. or the Staatsmine. So um, yeah, from mining all the way now to become a life science company, and that's exactly what's, what's happening, of course. So a company which is uh, focused on, uh, on the one hand, health, nutrition, mm -hmm. and beauty. Um, so that's the new company, that's DSM Firmly from today. Yeah, and, and what do you think that's gonna mean for you guys in the end, like uh, where is it going? I would actually say that's going to only accelerate actually um, the the amount of, of resources we we put in in for example innovation. So it's really the innovators in health, nutrition, and beauty. So of course, when you actually become more focused, you can also then get more focused on innovation, for example, in that space. And to give you a few examples in the microbiome space, that the fact that we are now sp uh, working on the one end in animal, mm -hmm. um, but also in pets, and also of course in human. You can imagine if whatever you learn in a microbiome space and microbiome, uh, the, the, the gut brain axis, as they talk about, uh, that's something which is ve very relevant for animal, but also very relevant, of course, for pet and even more so maybe for human. So you start actually being able to start combining these kind of elements, but also skincare. So perfumery and beauty, skincare, mm -hmm. very important as well, actually, in the animal space. So you, you start cross fertilizing something we couldn't do before. Because what you learn in the microbiome doesn't mean anything in plastics. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that was the, the dilemma, of course, in a diversified company. Whereas when you're now becoming a, a kind of united company in life sciences, focusing on animal, pet and human again, um, that gives us that kind of opportunity, that, that leverage really to start working on, on the, sci the science and accelerate business growth. Exactly. Well, it sounds really exciting and it is. a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you yourself, you became president of the animal nutrition uh, and health par uh, department yeah. uh, like four years ago. Yeah. What are some challenges you have experienced in those years? I described the last four years, actually, uh, I think in a normal normal lifetime, <laughs> and that would have been kind of 10 years. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> no, I, you have to, uh, to bear with me there. Um, what happened actually in the last four years, and I might even forget something now because so much happened. <laughs> so I joined the, uh, indeed, uh, in July, uh, so four years ago, roughly. 
Uh, and then we were first actually were faced with quite a bit of a challenge in terms of our cost and our EBITDA, et cetera. So we had a bit of a cost measure uh, exercise, which was not pleasant at all. So yeah, we had to let go a few people. Um, yeah, but then if I didn't talk about the timing thereof, the timing actually was in February, mm -hmm. February 2020. Huh? And we all remember what happened in March. Oh, yes. Uh, it was really literally announced to people actually on the day that actually COVID actually broke out. And mm -hmm. some people were not even uh, been able actually to speak then physically to, um, to the fact whether they actually had a job or not. So that was stage one. Yeah. Then stage two actually in this whole uh, saga was, of course, COVID-19 and uh, working from home, uh, quite a difficult period. And then the Biomin acquisition came along. So we actually, um, we were in the process of acquiring Biomin, but of course also with COVID-19, severely hampered. So um, I didn't see co uh, the Biomin facilities mm -hmm. because we couldn't travel. No. So I had to take the plunge and actually decide on whether that was a good move or not. Now, the rest is history. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was. The reason why we're sitting here today, World Nutrition Forum, was something which came out of um, the Biomin legacy, the way they actually mm -hmm. dealt with customers, how they talked about science, etc. cetera. Um, but that was, at hindsight, maybe very easy. But whilst you were right in the midst of the storm, taking a decision to acquire a company for one billion, and you're not 100% sure, that's a quite different experience. And then from then on, of course, um, growth starts picking up again. So that was good, uh, coming out lockdowns. Um, but then the integration uh, started as well. Mm -hmm. With Biomin, uh, the legacy DSM, integrating that new business model, new operating model. And of course, uh, over the last year, another storm actually hit us. Um, another storm in terms of China, China demand really going down. They went into lockdown. The mm -hmm. rest of the world actually going up again. Uh, we had cost, we had inflation, we had the energy crisis. Now, I talked about it in my speech, I think it's a time well described by a polycrisis and that's all happening in the last four years. So it's been quite an exciting time to say the least. Yes, yeah, yeah you can say that. And, and talking about your, your speech mm -hmm. you had here at the World Nutrition Forum, um, what was your main message in that? What would you say? Yeah, the main message and I was so happy actually with the word cloud already um, asked before, you know, what is the, the main uh, kind of focus? Um, I can't remember the, ex the exact phrasing of the, uh, the question, but what is the, the main kind of the next frontier? Uh, I think that was the question. And the, the answer coming back from the, the crowd without me it's even being on, on stage was about mm -hmm. data yeah. and transparency. And my whole speech actually was done in one minute in a way, because <laughs> uh, I, I'm totally convinced that that's, that's going to be the next frontier. Uh, data can be giving us so much more leverage, not DSM I'm talking about, but the value chain. So much more leverage really to, to drive animal protein and the sustainability thereof. Um, so that is together with, of course, technology de developments, as we've seen, uh, feed additives, feed composition, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That needs to, to carry on for sure. But using data to develop algorithms, but also actually drive efficiency and effectiveness on the farm level, mm -hmm. That's going to be the next frontier, and that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And we have that slogan, and you saw that today as well, making the invisible visible. Yeah. Um, really getting a, a picture on what's happening on the farm level, and yeah. then making a difference between farmer A and farmer B, where farmer A gets rewarded and recognized for the efforts he or she is making versus farmer B. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of system we need to set up. But you can only do that if there's data, if there's transparency. And then preferably when the consumer is being taken along, of course, in that, in that journey. So yeah. when you go to the supermarket, you can say, right, okay, this chicken breast from farmer A has a different label, has a different footprint than that chicken breast from farmer B. That's where we need to go to, because otherwise yeah. you are only able to actually decide on the price or maybe on the taste exactly. or quality. And now I think what needs to be happening is that we start bringing in the externalities. Uh, and what I mean with externalities, we need to bring in emissions, um, the environment, the footprints in the, the choice of the consumer at that point in time. So yeah. um, quite, an, an, I think, an instrumental kind of uh, step right now. Mm -hmm. We see it happening, eco-scoring, virus scoring, all these kind of um, labeling activities mm -hmm. happening. Uh, there's probably too many of them right now. Yeah, but I, for I me, so. it's clear <laughs> that it's narrowing down. Yeah, I think there's... There's too many labels out there anyway. Yeah. Number is, one. It could be confusing for the totally, uh, totally. consumer. Totally. Or that, that's why I think we need to go for more uniform labels. Yeah. 
but also something which is based on quantifiable data so that people can start comparing. And mm -hmm. now the, the problem is, and I'll, I'll make it a little bit of a black and white statement, mm -hmm. on one packaging you find a nice leaflet, and on the other one you find a butterfly, on the other one you find a symbol of a foot. Yeah, what does and it mean? <laughs> there's just a plethora of, of, of labeling right now, mm -hmm. and you and me as consumers, when we go to the supermarket, we can't even see the forest through the trees anymore. No. No. So, in my view, what, what needs to happen is that we go for a uniform labeling, a little bit like in the, um, the spaces we have now on white goods. If you go and buy a washing machine or an oven or whatever, you have a labeling there. You yeah. can compare manufacturer A to manufacturer B to C. You mm -hmm. can compare. Also with cars. Yeah. Now the same, I think, needs to be happening in food and it will happen. There is something right now, like yeah. the Nutri-Score, yeah. that's also yeah. like a lot of discussion about yeah. it, I believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think I wholeheartedly support that. It. It's not mm -hmm. perfect. I think that's the um, the whole debate in, uh, definitely in Holland, actually, it was a debate. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of eyes were on the Dutch government, whether they're going to approve it or not, and yeah. uh, they finally approved it. True. Um, they also were able to manage a few kind of tweaks for the Nutri-Scoring. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm supportive of it is not because it's perfect. It's by no means perfect. But by the fact that we start adopting now on packaging, you will see that it's being adopted and it's going to be slowly but surely actually improved. Now, the same, I think, is going to be happening on Enviro scoring, eco scoring, the same kind of uh, trend you will find. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to the agricultural sector more. Yeah. Um, in the Netherlands, also, yeah, we're already there now. Yeah. It's your home country yeah. as well. Um, there are a lot of um, negative. Um, comments about the agricultural sector there mm -hmm. how do you feel about that or how how do you stay possible of a positive in that yeah um i think there's there's a lot of also positive comments i, I would like to uh, to make that statement immediately mm -hmm. because we saw it actually coming back from the political landslide yes um, and if you look into the public debate um uh, the, the one thing I, I will say i think it was it's, it's a very polarized debate mm -hmm. And that, that I think we need to be very careful of, that it becomes a polarized debate where it's becoming black and white. And I think the world is not black and white. There's, there's kind of a middle ground. Um, the one thing I actually observe, and that's probably not being lived in Holland right now, but I, I, I live in Switzerland mm -hmm. and I travel the world. I get to see many customers like you see uh, today here in World Nutrition Forum. And what's amazing actually, what keeps amazing me is um, the, the power of the Netherlands in the space of agricultural kind of um, knowledge and, and science. Um, the name Wageningen is, is very renowned, uh, but also the way agriculture is done actually in Holland. So we should, I think, take more pride in what we do there. Absolutely. While still acknowledging that we have a bit of a, of a dilemma here to face. So yeah. I think we should not walk away from the challenge. There is a, a challenge. Um, but at the same time, we shouldn't really throw all the science, all the knowledge away for the sheer fact that we just need to speed up now. Mm -hmm. um, I find, I think the approach being taken by the Dutch government uh, initially was not the right, the right way. Uh, it was just like stopping a lot of farming practices, yeah, whereas they've been farmers. supporting it actually over the, yeah. the years before. You know, you, you can't change the system that, that fast. So I see a lot of willingness with farmers. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of willingness in the value chain, but allow them a little bit of time really to start transforming and, of course, also innovating. There's and yeah, so some, some farmers will also step out for sure. Yeah. So, but it there's was so a much bit, knowledge in, in yeah. there with the yeah. Dutch farmers as well. So yeah, it would we be shouldn't ways. really underestimate. I think um, the efficiency we have right now with dairy cows in um, in Holland, for example. But the whole debate, by the way, seems to be only on dairy. Uh, I think there's also something yeah. called a chicken and also swine. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't see that debate as uh, as strongly there, which also surprises me. I'm not saying let's drag them in, but uh, I sometimes get a feeling even that dairy cows you can see they they're walking out in the in in the uh, in the pastures uh, in the in the meadows. You can see them. And therefore, they're becoming a bit of a of a focus area. Whereas, of course, also in swine and poultry, you have the challenges. Yeah, and emissions and everything. And definitely also in emissions. And I think the emissions, and that, that is also a debate I miss somewhat, or at least the, the angle there. At the end, they would talk about nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And nitrogen is imported. So an animal like, like a cow actually grazes on grass. Mm -hmm. The grass in itself is protein that contains nitrogen. But if the manure of that animal is then released again on that pasture, then you have a closed loop circle. Yeah. So you only introduce nitrogen via fertilization, 
chemical fertilization, and of course, or actually importation of soy or wheat or grains from elsewhere. That's when the, the problem starts. So we need to start going back to where's the nitrogen coming from instead of saying, oh, dairy cows are bad. Exactly. So yeah. I missed that fact-based kind of discussion. I've not heard that, no. Um, in all fairness, I've not been living in Holland maybe <laughs> for some time, but I've followed the news uh, very closely. And of I've course. never seen yeah. this in the media. And there I would also actually challenge the media um, to go a little bit more fact-based. Well, we have a look at that. <laughs> Good. My challenge back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going, going back to the world uh, yeah. again. Yeah. And to round up as well, um, how do you see the future? Future of? Of the, the nutrition, the agricultural parts. Yeah. No, where I, you are working on as DSM yeah. Vermenich nu. Yeah, yeah. Well spoken indeed, DSM Vermenich. That's the future <laughs> indeed. So, um, now I, I said it in my speech yesterday. Um, we are now with 8 billion people on this planet. We're going to go to 10 billion. That's kind of a given. Um, so that means 25% more people on this planet actually in 25 years, That's roughly crazy. speaking. That yeah. is gigantic. If you think about that step up of 2 billion, how long that took in the decades or ages before. And now we're going to do that in the next 25 years. Now, the world cannot just afford just to create more um, agricultural uh, land, actually, just for these 25%. So we need to come up with different solutions because food and feed will become a bit of a challenge. I think they start actually having a competition there. And we'll have, a, I think, a competition for land, but also then the water usage, etc., everything associated. So innovation is going to be absolutely important. Now, one of the elements I already highlighted, data, using data, to start, to start steering more on efficiency. Uh, you've seen a few of the charts, uh, which are also shown from a, an efficiency, also environmental perspective. I'm convinced that if we're going to apply the best practices, you have a lot of gains. We've done a few surveys and there, there's about 20, 30% gain there to be, uh, to be taken. And we start, need to start pricing in the externalities. That means we need to start pricing in emissions, um, but also the footprint mm -hmm. that you and me actually have a chance indeed to see what kind of products we buy and what kind of footprint we actually ourselves then actually create in a way. So that's going to be an important one, but that, um, that there's going to be a challenge, that's, that's a given. Um, I think there's also going to be a bit of, um, of an innovation space. I mentioned that er uh, earlier today as well on mm -hmm. feed. Um, We're now completely dependent on soy and wheat and grain typically being imported into the Netherlands, for example, but also uh, the, the major part of, of Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that single cell proteins, uh, so microbials uh, based on, on yeast, based on algae, based on bacteria, that they will start becoming a source of protein. So that not necessarily we're going to be uh, using crops and lands to produce proteins, but we start actually going to the alternative sources. There's quite a bit of innovation happening in that space. Yeah. Uh, watch that space. Uh, yeah. Definitely, if you're interested, keep an eye on that. Because um, there's a lot of, of stuff happening, definitely right. with the geopolitical kind of tensions, where you don't want to become 100% dependent on one region for your food or feed kind of imports. Yeah. Um, this is a very important element for geopolitical reasons, but also for food security in a later stage. And make sure that it stays affordable. Well, well spoken. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Yeah. And Thank you. Good Thanks luck. for the questions. Yes, you're welcome. Good. If you want to see more of Future Feed Talks and maybe listen to the podcast as well, click on the links below.